Thanks for joining our Dialing Into Your Best Dairy, a podcast series brought to you by dairy educators with Cornell University. In this series, we'll be walking through a cow's life cycle to pinpoint best management practices to maximize each cow's genetic potential in your herd. In this episode, we're going to be talking about managing heifer inventory to maximize your herd's potential. I'm Kathy Barrett with Cornell's Pro Dairy Program, and the first person that we're going to be talking with today is Margaret Kwasdoff. Margaret is a regional dairy specialist with Cornell Cooperative Extension's Northwestern New York Regional Dairy Team. Margaret, how about you start us out with the impact that heifer inventory has on a farm? Yeah. It has to do with farm efficiency, farm profitability, and helps you plan and reach goals regarding farm size, as well as giving your heifers the best chance to reach their genetic potential. Many farms tend to have too many heifers in their inventory, and some of those reasons are that we've had an increase in the use of sex semen, which results in a higher proportion of pregnancies carrying heifer calves. Another reason might be improvements in reproductive efficiency. We've done a better job getting cows bred at the right time and pregnant, resulting in more calves being born on the farm. We've also had a lot better colostrum management and practices over the recent years. There's been a greater understanding and improvements in this area, and everyone's done a good job of testing colostrum for quality, properly managing it to maintain quality of that colostrum, and learning proper delivery of the colostrum to the calf. And this really sets the calf up for success in our system. Also, overall better calf management and raised standards of health. We've had better and quicker reactions and prevention of diseases and overall better care and training of our employees when it comes to our calves. And this has resulted in more heifers making it through our system, which increases our heifer inventory over time. So all of a sudden, we have more heifers than we've had in past generations of farming. And we have to start to think about if we really need to keep all of them. So the things that you just listed are all positive developments, but still there's a benefit to carrying the appropriate amount of heifers. So could you kind of talk us through that as well? Yeah, so some of the benefits of reducing your heifer inventory to the appropriate numbers include decreasing your stocking density. So um, we always hear farms talking about how they have too many heifers and they, they need to build another heifer barn. But if you instead think about keeping and calculating your farm to carry only the right number of heifers, you might be able to save on your barn cost and you'll only be keeping your healthiest heifers that have the best potential to be efficient and profitable in your herd. Another benefit to having an appropriate inventory is maximize growth and health of those animals that you do keep. Think about your group pens with too many animals in them. They're often competing for feed and water and clean dry bedding resources and they can be stressed. This could lead to increased incidence of disease and poor growth rates, slowing down the time it takes for them to enter the milking herd. A third benefit to carrying the proper amount of heifers on your farm can come from a little bit of pre-planning. You could actually produce a valuable co-product from your dairy. Excess dairy animals can be sold into the market, though proceed with caution and do your research on this one. The dairy heifer market is uncertain right now, Um, but you might have a better chance at thinking about a dairy beef cross calf as a co-product of your farm, because they may still bring a better price than Holstein bull calves in the beef market. So moving on, dialing in to keep only the heifers you need has the potential to reduce labor and increase profitability in this way. Fewer, healthier animals take less time to care for, and it's way more fun to work with them if you're not constantly spending money and time treating sick animals. So focusing on raising the right heifers instead of all the heifers will benefit the farm in the long run. So again, we're shifting away from quantity and really want to focus on the quality of our replacement animals on the farm. So Margaret, that kind of begs the question, so how do we know how many animals we need on the farm? And is there kind of a method you could walk us through for that? Yeah, Kathy. Uh, Each farm is going to be different in the number of replacement heifers it will need on an annual basis. So when you're thinking about the right number of heifers for your operation, you should consider a few things. You're going to think about your future herd size goals and also a three to five percent cushion on top of that number in order to avoid purchasing heifers later on if a circumstance throws your inventory off and you need more than predicted. 
You also want to consider your current herd size and your call rate of your mature cows in the herd, also your age at first calving, and your heifer calling rate, including the mortality loss, because all of these factors go into how animals and how many animals move through your farm. With that information, you can determine your appropriate number of heifers for your operation. When calculating inventory need to maintain herd size, so you're maintaining, you're not growing in the next few years, you're maintaining, you first need to know your total number of mature cows, the number of first calf heifers you have, and the number of dry cows. You also need to know your farm's age at first calving in months, your herd cull rate, and your non-completion rate. Non-completion rate is the percent of heifers that start in your system, but do not make it into the milking string for one reason or another. So let's walk through a quick example. The scenario is that you have a 100 cow dairy planning to maintain herd size, 22 month age at first calving, a call rate of 33% and a non-completion rate of 10%. This is gonna give you about 34 heifers needed to maintain herd size on an annual basis. Once you know how many heifers you need to maintain herd size, you can calculate the number you actually have born each year. You can also look this up in your records but for the calculation, you need all the information we had before, plus the calving interval in months. Keep in mind that the percent of heifer calves born might be different depending on your farm's use of sex semen. Also on your farm's calf mortality rate, which is the percent of calves that die within 24 hours of birth. You will not need the non-completion rate for this calculation. Going back to our scenario, We've added a calving interval of 13 months, 55% of calves are born as heifers, and a total calf mortality rate of 10%, which I know is a little high, but um, our goal should be under 5%, but for this calculation, you're gonna get about 49 heifers born annually on this farm. Now, to determine the number of extra heifers you have, you can take that number of heifers needed, which was 34, and multiply that by 1.05 to include a cushion of 5% extra heifers to keep, and you get a total of 36 heifers needed annually. Then subtract that number from 49 that you have coming in, and you end up with a total of 13 extra heifers annually. Now, some people get nervous about cutting back on heifers, but based on projected heifer price, cutting back is still more financially sound than the cost of raising too many heifers. Excess heifers can still be sold later, but the return is not as great as the loss due to raising too many. For further detail, including calculations, refer to Jason Carsey's document on heifer raising economics, which will be linked in the resource area for this podcast. Keep listening to learn how to choose who stays and who goes in your heifer inventory. Thanks very much, Margaret. Next, we're going to be talking about the role that genetics plays in heifer inventory management. And for that, we've invited Lindsay Warden from the Holstein Association to join us. Lindsay is the director of the Holstein Association's genetic services. Welcome, Lindsay. Could you start out by explaining your role with the Holstein Association and a little bit about your background in the dairy industry? I was uh, born in upstate New York. When I was 10, my family relocated our dairy farm to southeastern New Mexico, so I've got that western experience. I I went to college in Wisconsin. While I was in college, my family relocated back to central New York, where they dairy farm today. I'm still fairly involved in the farm, as time allows. And right after college in Wisconsin, I I moved here to southeastern Vermont to work for the Holstein Association. So I just celebrated my 13-year anniversary with the association. I've been in my current role for going on seven years. As the head of the genetic services department, I spend a lot of my time just working with our members, going to meetings, traveling to farms, and having conversations with them about how they can breed a more profitable herd of Holsteins. Lindsay, could you describe for us how genetic and reproductive technologies have impacted the rate of genetic gain on farms? It's really been incredible to see the adoption of genomics over the past 10 years by the dairy industry. I I remember the very early days um, in my career here at Holstein when genomics was just starting to be talked about and the first tests that came out were very expensive. Results only came out a few times a year and it was really just used as as a tool to select the most elite breeding stock that would be bull mothers and AI sires and things like that. 
but it very quickly evolved and the test got more affordable. And we've seen a tremendous adoption by dairy farms of, of all sizes. And so just the amount of testing going on, the way the farmers are using the information has just been really incredible. And so we've seen a lot of herds transition to a, a whole herd testing strategy where they're using it to select which heifer calves they might even just sell as babies. And then when they're raised in their breeding age, deciding you know who gets to pass their genetics on to the next generation, who might be a recipient for an embryo, who might get bred to beef, and also just the commercial adoption of technologies like embryo transfer and in vitro fertilization that we used to just mostly see kind of in the, the high-end sector. They're really being, again, used by farms of all sizes to replicate the best genetics on those farms in a very big way. So it's been tremendous to see all these farms that maybe perhaps genetics didn't used to be a, a focus area for them through genomics. Even if they didn't know that much about the lineage of their cattle, they've been able to use genomics to really uncover and discover the quality of their genetics. Sometimes it was already great. Other times they were able to identify areas for improvement. And once they've identified those areas, just the rate at which they've been able to kind of change the course and improve their herd has just really been mind-blowing. Lindsay, could you talk about how these technologies have impacted the number of heifers we have on farm? Yes, it's been really interesting, again, to kind of hear more conversations, especially over the past couple of years, really switch to um, focusing on managing that heifer inventory. I think a lot of farms we didn't really see be that strategic about breeding their animals. Everybody got bred, sex semen became very popular, so some herds really adopted that. So we've certainly seen plenty of farms that just say, hey, we have way too many heifers. And so there's been a lot of discussions on that, especially over the past few years with the economics of the industry, just really trying to tighten up those inventories to make sure that those extra animals aren't being fed and things like that. So it's been, um, again, genomics and genetics has played a good role in this of being able to say, okay, we only need this number of heifers for the next generation. Really just trying to make sure that you're getting those heifer calves out of your best cows so I think we're definitely transitioning to that now where we're seeing a lot of herds be really dialed in and the calves that they're making are really valuable because they do have the best genetics that are available on the farm. And then they also, you know, have an additional profit center through perhaps if they've been using beef semen or, or things like that, just getting, selling those calves at a young age so that they're not weighing down their inventory and they're having to pay to feed them. Any other types of strategies that you focus on with the farmers you interact with? Yeah, I think it's just really important to do that segregation of animals when they're breeding age or if you have the older lactation animals. Just really making sure that it's not just the first so many cows that come into heat maybe get bred to sex semen. Really earmarking those animals to make sure that the, the ones that you're getting your calves out of are the most valuable ones. Deciding if perhaps using a technology like embryo transfer or in vitro fertilization might make sense if the genetic merit's high enough. That's another strategy as well, but it's just really using using the information that you have. Obviously, genomic testing is an investment, and my number one thing I talk about with farmers when they're considering genomic testing is, what's your plan? And so using this idea of, of who gets to be the parents of the next generation is really foundational to that plan. So the most important thing to make progress is to decide what your plan is and then execute it. We know genetics is a it's a long term game. It's not a not a short term situation. So it's really important just to keep focused on those goals, keep the goals consistent, and just make sure that plan's being executed, you know, over time so that you're seeing the results that you want. Lindsay, if a farmer finds themselves in a position where they have more heifers than they need, quality heifers, what considerations from a genetic standpoint do you encourage them to look at? Sure. So once you've got your kind of healthy pool of calves and, and you still have, have too many, uh, my general recommendation is to just pick one of the major industry selection indexes. So the Holstein Association has the Total Performance Index, TPI. The Council on Dairy Cattle Breeding has the Net Merit Dollars Formula. For folks that would be genomic testing with Zoetis, they have the Dairy Wellness Profit Dollars Formula. And there's also other things like Cheese Merit and fluid merit dollars as well. So I really um, usually try and talk with farms about figuring out which one of those selection indexes most closely aligns with the general goals of their farm because they're all different. A lot of them have similar traits, but they place slightly different emphasis on different areas. And I generally find that most farms can pick one of those major publicly available indexes 
and use those to sort their animals versus trying to get too specific and, and having cutoffs and things like that. Generally, pick one of the major selection indexes that's available, whichever one most closely aligns with your farm's goals, and use that to rank your animals, and the lowest ranking animals would be the ones to go. If the farms do have a unique situation, there's a lot of different organizations, groups, the Holstein Association offers this, as well as different organizations the farms might work with. You can develop your own customized index for your own farm if you have some different breeding goals, but as I said, in general, one of the major industry indexes, whether it's TPI, Net Merit, Cheese Merit, or Dairy Wellness Profit Dollars, those generally are useful for farms to help sort their animals. Great. Thanks very much, Lindsay. So before we wind up here, was there anything else that you think that would be uh, worthwhile to share with producers on this subject? Yeah, I'm, I'm very happy to, to hear that genetics is part of this conversation. It's been a lifelong passion of mine, so it's been um, really fun to watch the whole industry really get into this. And again, I've just been so impressed with the way dairy farmers are embracing it. So if you're a farm that hasn't yet looked into genomic testing, I certainly encourage you to take a look at it. Um, it is an investment, of course, but there's different strategies that you know can certainly help it more than pay for itself. It, it's a valuable tool for herds of all sizes with all breeding goals. It can certainly help you make better decisions about your animals. Thanks very much, Lindsay. Thank you. off this episode, we have with us Dr. Rob Lynch, who is a veterinarian and the Dairy Herd Health and Management Specialist with Cornell's Pro Dairy Program. Rob, could you talk to us a little bit about herd health considerations when managing heifer inventory and developing culling policy? Sure. Thanks, Kathy. Yeah, culling policy and inventory management, they influence each other, but they're very different. So like inventory management, when I think of inventory management, I think of, you know, what are those long-term and even, you know, short to medium-term planning steps that take place so the dairy can meet their future goals. Like a dairy wants to increase uh, the size of the milking herd by 50% over the next five or 10 years or whatever. Or farm doesn't want to expand its herd, but does really want the most profitable herd of cows they can have going forward at the current number. So, these are the, the things that they're thinking of, of how many animals am I going to need in the future? And that is what they need to know when they're making, you know, breeding decisions and, and calling decisions now. You know, the dairy just needs to keep adequate numbers of all the various age groups. They need enough animals in each of those age groups to ensure that their future calling decisions aren't constrained by a lack of available replacements. When you'd like to sell an animal because she's not profitable for you anymore, but you don't have anybody to take her place in the near future, uh, that's not a great position to be in. It's not the most financially sound position to be in. So on one hand, you have what you need, just that basic inventory, but then you need to think about which animals you can keep, how many you can keep, and why those particular ones will be in the pipeline. Yeah, it's a real, it's a delicate balance. Like you want to have animals at the ready, so you can make the calling decisions that you want to make, but you don't want to have so much extra inventory around because that's expensive. You got to keep enough animals in the pipeline, but not too many. It's a pretty delicate uh, line to walk. There's also um, a fair bit of risk management that factors in here. The dairy needs to know what the potential threats are for the dairy and they can build their herd inventories accordingly. So threats would be like threats to health, threats to the business, things that would require additional animals in the pipeline to offset. And so, for example, if you're dealing with a lot of calf pneumonia, well, if you know that's going to be a lingering problem, you know you have to raise more calves to offset those additional losses that you're anticipating. And, you know, not to mention that the calves that you don't lose due to pneumonia, they don't grow as well they're more likely to leave later. They're not going to milk as well as, as grown-up cows. So, you know, coming up with strategies to work that risk out of the system is ideally what you're going to want to do from an inventory management standpoint. Maybe that's a new ventilation system, uh, ramping up the feeding program, improving the vaccination protocol, things that can reduce the risk so you don't have to expect additional losses and additional replacements to, to offset those health issues. 
Yeah, you know, that makes good sense, Rob. What if you were dealing with something in the milking herd? Well, yeah, I mean, same rules apply there. I, I want to have fresh heifers coming online to give me the ability to call the cows I want to call. Um, maybe we have an initiative where we're really trying to bring the average herd somatic cell count down. And there's several tax to take to accomplish that. One of those is identifying chronically high cell count cows and selling them off the farm. But I can't really do that very, very well if I don't have the, the animals at the ready to, to help me accomplish that. So when a farmer's looking at their total herd and thinking about these kinds of management decisions, what sort of things do you think they ought to be formulating for their culling policy? Yeah, I think you know, farms should have protocols in place. Like this is our culling policy. You have one for the milking herd, you'd have one for your heifer herd. And um, it's just the set of criteria that everyone on the farm agrees to that uh, this is when it's time to have an animal removed from the herd. On the milking herd side of things, a couple of things to remember. Ideally, we always want a good replacement animal at the ready uh, mm -hmm. to take a cow's place when it's time for her to be sold. Um, there are very few situations when an empty stall is preferred to an occupied stall. Uh, one example, you know, if an animal poses a risk to other animals in the herd, um, mm -hmm. she's got a contagious disease and she could be shedding to her herd mates and I can't really isolate her effectively. She needs to go sooner rather than later. But for, you know, cows that, you know, I treated, we got the condition resolved, but she never really came back into production whatsoever those cows are just operating at a constant loss. And so it makes sense to get those animals sold when it's safe to do so sooner rather than later, even if it means uh, them leaving before I've got that animal ready to take her place. She's consuming a lot of feed and not really making any milk, so it doesn't make sense. So for, like, for the non-treated cows, the decision to call from the herd is purely an economic one. When it's more profitable for the dairy to put a new cow in her place, that's when it's time for those cows to be sold. Um, and, and there's some strategies that one can come up with to make those economic decisions. Uh, dairy Comp has a tool built in called CowVal, which is just a really nice way to incorporate the economics of a culling decision. And so it, CowVal, it estimates when it's more profitable uh, to replace a milk cow with a fresh heifer versus keeping her in the herd. The CowVal calculations are made using the herd's own performance data and the user plugs in some market estimates. You know, what would be an expected market price for a call cow? What should we, what, where do we think milk price is probably going to be over the near term? We build those economics into the calculation and it'll generate what that, not a break even, but a minimum daily milk production, what that threshold level should be for a cow before when she falls below that threshold means um, she's not really paying her way anymore. And then you could use that cowbell item in any lists that managers are, are generating to you know, look for calling candidates. It'll show cows that go negative in their cowbell means it's more profitable for that farm to put an animal in her place. And if her cowbell is positive, it means she's, it's more profitable for her to stay in the herd versus replacing her with a fresh heifer, a fresh uh, average heifer. Um, it's really useful during herd check. You know, when, when we're figuring out the cows who are still open from last breeding and when breeding decisions are being made to what to do next, it's really nice to know what's her economic value for the farm right now. What would her economic value be if we were successful at the next breeding attempt? PregVal, PGVal is the, the other item that you can include on these lists and it will show you what happens to this cow if you're successful in breeding her. And, if the pregval doesn't make her profitable again, yeah, then it makes sense to mark her as a do not breed and she'll exit when it's makes sense to do so. And so how about the animals that are coming down the pipeline? So our heifers and our calves, what kind of considerations do you think farmers ought to keep in mind? Yeah, I mean, we don't have as much data to rely on in our replacement herd, but there should be culling policies in place here as well. Not every heifer gets to grow up and be a milk cow. I mean, that's a pretty safe, <laughs> a right. safe thing to say. So we have to rely on different metrics, obviously. 
performance metrics I think of for our placement animals would be probably first their health records. Are they thriving? Are they growing well? Um, we could look at their genetic potential. We could look at their pedigree numbers. We could look at their genomics. And then, you know, in the end, are they meeting our reproductive standards to get into our milking herd in a timely fashion? All that information should be evaluated when we're looking over our replacement herd just to decide these are the heifers that I want to remain in the herd and these are the heifers that probably doesn't make sense for me to hang on to. It's pretty well understood in the industry that a calf that struggles with health conditions as a youngster will not meet her genetic potential as, as an adult cow. You know, there's all the extra expense that goes into raising those animals, the delay in entry into the milking herd, and when they finally do become a milk cow, they just don't measure up to their healthy herd mates. So, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily call one right away, you know, on the first incidence of a health event, but we should be keeping good, accurate health records. You know, everybody on the farm, uh, this should be recorded accurately and consistently. It gives us something to fall back on to review when we're trying to decide, are there replacement animals in this herd that we should think about selling? So a systematic way of recording the treatment information that will serve as a future reference. There's a bunch of questions I feel like you should be able to answer when it comes to your, your health records. When should the calf be treated next? You should be able to answer that question by using your records. When will this calf be safe to sell? Like, so if she is a call candidate, when is it safe to do so? I got to have a, a set of information to fall back to to answer that question. Have we even followed the protocols that we all agree, agreed on? And we should be able to look at those treatment records and see, are we all following the guidance that we were given to, for as far as treating cows? Are the protocols even working? If we can look at success rates of the various protocols, as long as we've got this health data to review. And then treatment history. You know, has this calf been treated before for anything? Well, how many times has this calf had this disease? If we find that this is her third go around for whatever condition she had, does it make sense to keep treating? Do we have enough medicine in the cabinet? Is it stocked appropriately? Based on use patterns, we know when we ought to be stocking up the cabinet and not buying things that we're not using. So we can save some money that way too. It just makes answering those questions a lot easier if you've got good records to fall back to. And it's required. We're supposed to be recording this stuff, documenting it anyway. So we might as well do it in a way that makes them more useful. Brad, how about poor reproductive performance? Yeah, at the end of the line, we finally get these heifers grown up to uh, breeding size and age. We follow our breeding practices and some heifers, hopefully most heifers, they settle right away and they respond to our protocols. And, and then there's those that just don't. They don't settle, they don't show us heats. Um, it may not even be their fault. You know, it just may be you know, how aggressive the farm is at their heat detection or you know, the fertility may not be what you want it to be because of semen handling or, or those factors. So even though it's not their fault, it gets to a point where now this heifer is going to be a lot older than I want her to be when she calves in for the first time. She's a lot more expensive now because I've had to feed her longer. And then worst case scenario is we couldn't really keep control of body condition because of her age. And then by the time she does get to the calving pen, her body condition is is too high and just she becomes a real challenge to successfully get through calving and get through her transition without having her own health problems. So it makes sense to set some breeding standards. We'll breed this heifer X number of times, or we will breed heifers up until a certain age. And then if they're still not confirmed pregnant at that point, should they go on a beef list? All right, Rob, you've given us several things to kind of think about. Is there anything we missed? Well, I, one thing to... Uh, I've seen a lot of farms instituting now and it's really good information is tracking growth. Like you can, mm -hmm. you know, take some strategic points along the way, get body weights on groups of calves and understand are these calves thriving, which, you know, is a good proxy for good health. Mm -hmm. Are they responding to the diets? And they'll set some average daily gain benchmarks. So we really want our heifers to be gaining at these rates or be to this size by this age. And, and I think that's really good information to have. I, I guess I'm not, I'm not recommending that you would call an animal based on falling short on one of those growth metrics. Those growth target recommendations really probably fall more 
in line with what's the trend and what does that mean for my feeding program or, or what's going on in the environment or with the management that's leading to groups of calves falling short on their growth targets. Some of that may be an individual animal's her own issues, why she falls behind the others, and maybe she does become a call candidate. But I think farm managers are pretty astute. They know who those animals are already. Mm -hmm. So I look at growth data as overall heifer performance, not so much an individual culling tool. Thanks very much, Rob. Really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us and outline some of the factors that we ought to be considering. Well, thanks, Kathy. And yeah, glad to participate in Cornell Cooperative Extension's uh, podcast series. This podcast has been presented by Regional Dairy Educators with Cornell Cooperative Extension and ProDairy. Thank you.